Hey everyone, welcome back to Power Electronics. I'm Tim. Um, I hope you're all having a great day. Today, I wanted to talk about resonant converters. So last time, uh, we were talking about DABs, the dual active bridge, and I thought I was just going to finish that, lect that lecture series up with maybe an example, you know, going through the motions, doing all the algebra and stuff for designing a DAB, uh, and maybe I will. There have been some requests to do other things. If you guys have specific requests, uh, the more specific, the better. Then I can, you know, answer your questions better in video format. Feel free to ask. I'll, I'll try. I will do my best to answer those questions. And yeah, keep asking. If if I have the power to answer, I will. Cool. So today, resonant converters. Well, what are resonant converters? Basically, resonant converters employ resonance. So. In a sense, like DABs, they are AC power transfer converters, or they somehow convert a DC voltage to an AC voltage. They do some kind of resonance stuff, and then they produce a DC output. Typically, you can do other stuff, of course. But yeah, we're, right now we're thinking of DC to DC converters. That's what we're, we've been doing this whole time. So why would you want to use res a resonant converter? Well, typically, it's it's a topological solution to the switching problem, basically, or like hard switching. People want to avoid hard switching for certain applications, you know, maybe high voltage stuff, higher voltage stuff, higher power stuff, whatever, whatever the application may be. But where in situations where switching loss is significant, you can use resonant converters to employ soft switching. If you want to use a transformer and a DC-DC converter, resonant converters can do that as well. So there are benefits and there are trade-offs, right? So maybe in resonant converters, there, there's a, you might have higher circulating currents in the system, which might increase conduction loss a little bit. So really, there's you have to pick and choose where you want to use these. But again, resonant converters are very common. And we'll, we're going to kind of look at uh, how to construct them. So right now we're, we're, gonna, we're really thinking about the fundamentals. So how kind of develop this idea of resonant converters. So if we think back to the DAB, we had this idea of converting a DC voltage into an AC voltage, putting it through that transformer, right, with, with some leakage inductance, and then rectifying the output. And that's pretty much what we do here, right? So we have some input source, which is connected to, let's say, an inverter, right? And there are different kinds of inverters we can, we can use, just like with the DAB. And then that is connected to a resonant network, right? And this is where the, the, the resonance comes from in the name. And really, you can think of this as a filter. We analyze it in pretty much the same way. And then finally, we want to convert it back to DC, right? Because we're using this as a DC to DC converter, so we, we pass it to a rectifier, right? Just like the DAB. Really, the only difference is this middle bit. And then finally, we have the load, which I'll just put as a resistor RL. So we have VG over here. So we kind of have like a DC world over here, we have a DC world over here, and then in the middle we have these, you know, AC voltages and currents, and maybe maybe just in this whole world, that's what, that's what we're trying to do. And that's the basic structure. So the way I want to approach this at first, so that, you know, you understand what's going on, or it's easy to understand what's going on, I, I want to we have to analyze each of these different sections. So we, we have the inverter, we have this resonant network, and then we have the rectifier. So the reason I want to look, look at them separately is because we can choose different blocks to put in here, and choosing different blocks produces different circuits, or produces different topologies, you could say, specifically with the resonant network. So you could put in one kind of filter, and you would classify it as one kind of topology. There would be specific voltages and currents you'd have to worry about. You could put in a different filter and get, you know, different results. And it really comes down to what you're trying to do. 
typically what's involved is something called the first harmonic approximation. And this is important. I mean, it is an approximation and we'll see kind of where it breaks down. It's going to be a few, uh, this might take a few videos to get through all the nuances of these converters, but we'll, we'll see kind of where this first harmonic approximation breaks down. But basically what it does is we only consider the first harmonic of the waveform we generate, right? So usually inverters generate square waves. And you can make different inverters, obviously, with uh, different, which produce different kinds of waveforms. You can use multi-level converters, which produce waveforms with multiple steps. But in the end, there, there are always these sharp corners, which you try to filter out with some kind of filter, typically, right? So the first, first harmonic approximation is just saying, let's ignore, let's ignore uh, all the upper harmonics and only consider the first harmonic. A filter operates or acts differently on different frequencies, right? So if we were to consider each different harmonic of the waveform, we'd have to calculate, you know, the, the, uh, the filter response at each of those frequencies and then add them together. It would get pretty complicated. So really this is like a tool we use to understand how this uh, resonant converter works. And it'll be clear when we're using the first harmonic approximation. All right, so first, first Right, so the inverter, we, we want to generate a model to help us understand what's going on. The inverter I'm going to consider is a full bridge con inverter. So we have our input VG and we have our output voltage, which I'll just call V1. We also have an input current and we have our output current, which I guess I'll call the resonant current, IR. So we kind of already know what the what kind of waveforms we can make with this inverter. There's actually a few different kinds, but we're just going to consider 50% duty ratio. And what we get when we do a 50% duty ratio with this inverter is a square wave. Right, so we have TS, TS over two. You've all seen this before, right? So we can we can think about V one, the real V one of T, looks like this square wave, where it goes from VG to minus VG. So if you recall the Fourier series of a square wave, right, we end up summing something like 4 over pi times the amplitude, which is here Vg, times sine of, there's an n over here, times sine n omega t, right, where n is odd, right? We have all the odd integers, and we get this, this Fourier series. If we only consider the first harmonic, what that means is we consider a sine wave whose amplitude is 4 over pi times this amplitude, Vg, and whose frequency is the same as the, the fundamental frequency of the square wave, right? So our fundamental harmonic of this square wave is just this sine wave, right? Where this amplitude is four over pi dg, right? So it's a little bit higher than dg. So this is kind of like half of the model, right? We, we know when we apply this, uh, first harmonic approximation to this inverter, on one side we have a DC voltage source, and it produces on the other side an AC voltage source with uh, an amplitude of 4 over pi Vg. The other side is the current. So what does the current look like? Well again, we're considering the first harmonic, so if there's some kind of filter over here, then if we apply some sinusoidal voltage, right, this 4 over pi Vg sine omega t, 
then we're going to get some scaled version of that that's phase shifted, right? So that the, an example current might be something like, I don't know, let's just phase shift it some amount with some amplitude variation, right? Maybe the current looks something like this. So that there's some phase shift between V and I, and the amplitudes are slightly different. So this is amplitude IR. Right, so that's what the output current is going to look like, but we want to know what the input current is. How does the input current relate to this sinusoidal current? So what we're going to do is simply look at the average of this uh, IR. Well, not the average, actually, the, the average of the rectified current, right, relative to uh, the input. Right, so... What do we know about AC power transfer? Well, one, when current and voltage are in phase, that means that we're transferring real power, right? And when they're out of phase, it's all reactive power. So this kind of makes sense in the AC world, right? And really the thing that encapsulates this is power factor. Right, and the power factor for single harmonic, single frequency systems is simply the cosine of the angle between the current and voltage. Somehow we want this term to appear in the model for our input current. Again, the input current, IN, is going to be a rectified version of IR, right? Let's draw one half period of the current. So, again, th this current is going to depend on the phase shift. So, maybe when they're completely aligned, this input current looks something like this, right? And then maybe when there's some phase shift between them, maybe the current looks something like this, right? When they say the 90, 90, degree, 90 degrees phase shift between the voltage and the current on this side. We can describe this phase shift, phase shifted current pretty easily just using the sine equation, right? Even over one half period, right? So I n of t, the time varying input current, maybe I should write this as little lowercase i n of t. Really, this is just equal to the peak, which in this case happens to be related to the peak of the i r, right? So I'll just put i r here, times sine, and I'm kind of using sine arbitrarily, but it works out. Sine omega t plus phi, right? And this accounts for the phase shift between the voltage and the current, basically. this we're, we're describing this phase shift. So, knowing this, this equation, we can pretty easily find the average input current, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the average input current. So, I in of t, the capital I in of t, is really just the average of the lowercase i in of t over, in this case, one half of the switching cycle. Right, if we can calculate this, we know what the average input current is. So let's do that. All right, this is a pretty easy equation. So we're trying to find average I in, right, for our model. So what does it look like? Well, I in is going to be equal to, in this case, 2 over Ts, where averaging over half a switching period. The integral from zero to Ts over two of this thing, right? The time varying version, right? So IR sine, in this case, omega is two pi over Ts times T plus the phase shift phi dt. Okay, so, I mean, the real way that you would want to do this integration is, you know, you do, you do some substitution 
find the real answer. I'm just going to give you the real answer because this isn't a calculus course. And what you end up getting is 2 over pi times IR, right, the amplitude of the resonant current, times cos phi, right? So this is like the power factor, like what I was saying. In the end, this comes out in the wash. You end up getting this power factor in there. So when the current and voltage are completely out of phase, 90 degrees out of phase, then the average input current is zero. And you can kind of see that here, right? So when the current is 90 degrees out of phase, in one half of a switching cycle, it's going to be equally positive as it is negative, which means the average current is zero. And then the only time you get maximum current is when no part of this current goes below zero, right? And that is when voltage and current are completely aligned. So this is what our average input current is. So we kind of have all the pieces of information we need to construct the model for the, in, the, uh, the inverter, right? Our model for resonant converter. So what does the model look like? Well, on the one side, we know what our input is. It's just a DC voltage source. And we know what the, the, the input current draw is. The input current draw is exactly this, right? So we have... I'll just write it out explicitly. We have VG. We have some input current, IN. We know what this is equal to. It's equal to this value. We represent this with a, a current source, right? We suck this current out of the input whose value is equal to 2 over pi IR cos phi. Great. So that's the input side, right? On the or the DC side, right? On the AC side, what do we have? Well, the inverter effectively creates a fundamental frequency or fundamental harmonic with amplitude 4 over pi VG, right? So what we get on the AC side is an AC voltage source, right? Whose amplitude is 4 over pi VG. Right, and now this is this hooks up to the remaining AC circuit. And we can say this is V1. So this was for a full bridge, right? So for four controlled switches. You could do this for a half bridge, and basically the difference would be this would be half as big, right? Right, that, that is basically the difference. The current would, I believe, still be the same. So, this is our model for the inverter, right? So this is, a, this is AC over here. So now, let's look at the rectifier. There are the, the two flavors we're gonna look at are current fed and voltage fed or current driven and voltage driven voltage driven and these have actually two different models slightly different models we use these different rectifiers so that we can match up a something that is providing a voltage with something that draws a current and something that provides a current with something that provides a voltage, right? So it's just kind of to match up what the resonant filter is doing. So what do these two things look like? Well, I'm going to include a transformer just for completeness. They don't have to have con uh, transformers in the rectifier part, but it just will be convenient to include it here. So. On the current driven rectifier, what we have is a transformer. I would say it has turns ratio of one to n. And this goes to a full diode bridge rectifier. Again, you could you could have a full wave rectifier, that's totally cool. You could probably even do a single rectifier if you really wanted to. 
but this is connected to just a cap right and this rectifier again produces a DC output voltage right but if you think about it this is a constant voltage so if you're connecting a, if there's a voltage over here if this is driven by a voltage you're kind of what you end up doing is you connect a voltage source right say this is v2 a voltage source to another voltage source which produces you know current spikes and stuff typically not what you want so right so this is something that we want to use with currents right if we're we want to drive this with currents because we have a voltage source over here so we call this a current driven rectifier the voltage driven rectifier well this maybe you can guess what it would look like it's pretty much the same right we still have this transformer again with turns ratio of one to n let's say and we also have a full bridge diode rectifier and again this could be a different architecture but the principle is similar and instead of having just a capacitor we kind of have a an lc filter right and the difference here is that this inductor is going to act as a something like a constant current source right so we can say maybe this is i out so again, if we were to drive just a, a current through this, well, we're kind of connecting a, a current source, something that's providing a current, to another current source. Typically, what we don't want would cause cause voltage spikes or something similar, right? So we want to drive this rectifier with a voltage, right? We just want we want this to be a voltage-driven rectifier. Cool. And again, we have uh, V out over here. To develop this AC to DC model of this inverter, what we have to do is look at the waveforms of the voltages and currents. What we're trying to do is relate the AC currents and voltages to the DC currents and voltages. So, how do we do this? Well, we're going to inspect I out of T, right? This time varying current that occurs just after the rectifier, right? We know that the average of I out of T is going to be equal to the average output current, right? the current that's flowing through the load, the load resistance, right? So you could say you could say that I out is actually V out over R load. Right? And we also know that I out of T is simply the rectified version of I R of T. So we kind of already have a relation between these two currents. So let's just draw that out so it's clear. Right? And don't forget we have this transformer here. So I'm just going to do a full waveform here, right? Full TS. So TS, TS over 2. And on one side, we have IR of T, right? Which, for here, looks just like a sine wave uh, with zero phase. Why? Because on the DC side, we only have a resistor. Our load is, a, is we can say, resistive. What I mean by that is that it absorbs real power. It only absorbs real power. There's no imaginary power that it's, that it's taking. I mean, you could for some applications, but really most loads do real work, right? What that means is that on the AC side, because only real power is being provided, the current and voltage are going to be aligned, right? And that's kind of true even with just this rectifier. So obviously non-idealities with the rectifier are going to change things, but for the most part, IR and V2 are going to be aligned because we're providing real power to the output. So, because of that, and because we're only looking at one section of the converter, I'm going to choose to align IR with zero, right? I can kind of do that freely just because we're looking at one small section, right? This just makes it easier to do integration eventually. So, we have IR of T which looks like a sine wave, right? With peak, let's say, IR. I out of T is the rectified version of this, right? So when IR is positive, I out is positive. When IR is negative, I out is still positive. Note 
that we have this transformer here, right? So the peak of I out is going to be scaled compared to IR, right? It's going to be scaled by n, right? So whereas here we have IR, I out is going to have peak IR divided by n, right? Because 1 times IR is equal to n times I out, basically. So I out, the peak must be IR over n. Cool. So that's the current. And then as we were saying with the voltage, because we're providing real power to the output, the current and voltage are going to be aligned here. All right. So let's just consider what happens then. So again, this is a current driven rectifier, which means the current decides the state of the, of the system, basically. All right. So when the current is positive, when IR is positive, it's going to forward bias this diode and this diode, right? Which means that we're going to have positive V out over here, right? When, say, 1 and 4 are on, we're going to have a positive V out over here, which is going to then get reflected to the, to the primary side, right? Which means V2 for this first half of the switching cycle is going to be positive. It's going to be related to V out. It's not going to be exactly V out. It is actually going to be V out over N, right? Because of the transformer. And then when the current is negative, well, as you would expect, the voltage also goes negative, right? When the current is negative, we can say that diodes two and three, two and three are turned on, which means we're going to have negative V out over here, which is going to get reflected to the primary side. Right? And again, it's not going to be V out, it's going to be V out over N, minus V out over N. Cool. So this is a square wave. We have not yet applied for uh, first harmonic approximation. When we do, what we get is a voltage, a sign with peak related to the, to the peak of the square wave, but scaled by a factor of 4 over pi. Right? So... The peak of this sign is 4 over n pi v out. Cool. So with these two waveforms, we have related the AC voltages and currents to the DC voltages and currents. Basically, right? We know how they relate. Now, we have this AC waveform for I out, or this time varying waveform for I out. We want to know what the DC of I out is, right? So I out, the average is equal to the average of I out of T over one half of a switching cycle, right? Because this first half is the same as this second half. So let's do this integration. Let's do this averaging right now. So what do we have? This is equal to, again, over half a switching cycle, 2 over Ts. We integrate from 0 to Ts over 2. And then we have a sine wave, basically, right, in this first half, with amplitude IR over N, sine omega T, again, this is 2 pi over TS, times DT, right? So we, we can do the, the, inter, the integration 2 over TS, IR over N, and then we, we get some scaling factor. We're going to divide by omega. Again, this is related to TS. And then we're going to get cos omega T evaluated from 0 to Ts over 2. What this ends up being is 2 over n pi times IR. Right. So again, note here that there is no phase shift involved. Why is that? It's because basically this is uncontrolled. If we're using diodes, we, don't, we can't control the phase relationship between the voltage and current. When the current is positive, the voltage is positive, right? So basically they're always going to be aligned. So the average I out is equal to 2 over n pi times IR. So this kind of gives us a piece of our model. What is the other piece? Well, the other piece is kind of right here, right? So we know that V2, the peak of V2, amplitude of V2, is simply equal to 4 over n pi V out. Cool. Cool. We're, we are, you know, close to what we want. Now, what does this say? It tells us what the... Uh, the current and voltage actually look like, right? Now we can write an equation for I R of T. I R of T, we know what the amplitude is. It's n pi over 2 times I out, 
the average I out times sine omega t, right? And this also tells us what the waveform, right? What this waveform of V2 looks like. So V2 of t is equal to this V2, which is 4 over n pi V out. This is the amplitude times sine of omega t. So we're, we're really close to completing our model, basically, right? Now, I want you to note something here. These are always aligned, right? The voltage and current on the AC side are always aligned, which means that effectively they're feeding something that looks like a resistor. What is that resistance? Well, it's some kind of equivalent resistance. What does that look like? Right? Where, where is this resistance? Well, if the voltage and current are aligned, then it means that looking in here, it looks like a resistor. Right? When we look into this primary side of the transformer, it basically looks like we're looking at a resistor. What is this resistance? What is our equivalent? Well, we can find it pretty easily, right? We can find the equivalent resistance by dividing voltage by current, right? So our equivalent is simply equal to V2 of t over IR of t. And we have equations for both of these things, right? V2 of t is 4 over n pi V out sine omega t, right? IR is equal to n pi over 2 I out sine omega t. And really, because these are completely aligned, we can just cancel these out, right? which means that the equivalent resistance, if we do some stuff, do some simple algebra, we get eight over n squared pi squared times V out over I out. And remember, V out over I out is our load resistance, right? Which means this is equal to eight over n pi squared, n squared pi squared times R load. So on the AC side, of this model, this inverter, or this rectifier, sorry, what we end up with is a scaled version of our load resistance, right? Scaled by this factor 8 over n squared pi squared, right? So what does this mean? Our model is saying that the AC side looks like a resistor, and the DC side just looks like a current source connected to our cap and load, right? So what does our model look like? Basically, we have some equivalent resistance, right, over here, which is equal to, again, 8 over n squared pi squared times R load. Right, we have V2, we have IR of T, you could say this is V2 of T. And then on the DC side, we rectify this AC current, right? This is a current driven rectifier, so we expect some AC, some DC current on the DC side, which feeds basically our cap, which feeds our load. And you can arguably eliminate this, right? So this current is simply equal to two over n pi IR, right? And this is V out, right? We have R load. So this, this is our model, right? This it encapsulates the resistance and the effect of the rectifier. So to be even more clear, this bit is from the rectifier. Right, the eight over pi squared. If there's no if there's no transformer, you'd still get this eight over pi squared factor. This bit accounts for our uh, transformer. Now, what does the model look like for the voltage-driven rectifier? Well, the analysis is very, very similar, right? So what we're going to do is pretty much the same thing. Again, we have a, we have a, a resistance as our load, which means that the voltage and current are going to be aligned. But in this case, instead of it being driven with a current, it's driven with a voltage, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at voltage and current waveforms
to relate the AC side to the DC side. So let's do this. Let, let's see what the AC current and voltage looks, looks like. So again, this is a voltage driven rectifier and you can tell that because we have this current at the output, right? So maybe what I want to draw here is that we have some V out of T over here, right? So the voltage is going to decide if this is positive or negative. And then this filter is going to implies that the average of V out is capital V out, right? So in other words, V out is actually V out, the average of V out over T over one half of the switching cycle. Cool. So back to the waveforms. I'll draw again the full switching cycle so you see that we're actually thinking about a rectifier. So we have TS, we have TS over two, right? So again, V2 of T, I guess it's an orange over here. V2 of T, we're assuming is an AC waveform, right? And I'm going to choose that this is aligned with zero, just so the integration is easier to do. So this voltage driven rectifier sees some input voltage that is V2, some peak V2, right? And then so this is V2 of T. V out of T is a rectified version of this, right? So V out of T is simply whenever it's positive, it's positive, and whenever it's negative, it's positive, right? And it's gonna be scaled by this transformer. So we scale this input voltage and we make it always positive. And the peak of this output voltage, V out of T, is actually n times v2 of t. Cool, so this is the voltage, and we can do something similar with the current. So again, you can imagine that this output forces there to be a constant current. We have a constant current here. So when v out is positive, diodes one and four will be turned on, basically, and that means that i out is gonna flow in this direction, right? Again, I'll just, I'll make, make sure the dots are here. So. If it's flowing out of this dot, it's flowing into this dot. Whenever I out is positive, a constant so, uh, DC current, IR is going to be is going to match that, right? And then similarly, when V out is negative, diodes two and three will be on, and then the current will reverse. So we're going to have a square wave current, right? That whose polarity is determined by the voltage. And again, because our load is resistive. Where it's all real power, there is no reactive power, which means that the voltage and current are going to be aligned. So let's draw that. So again, when the current is positive, IR of T is going to be equal to I out, positive I out. When V2 is negative, it's going to be equal to negative I out. All right, so this is I out, this is minus I out. And obviously there is going to be uh, a factor of N, right? So there's N, N I out, correct? Because of the transformer. Now, we have not yet applied the first harmonic approximation. If we do that, again, the sign, the first harmonic, is, re is related to the amplitude of the square wave by a factor of four over pi, right? So the peak of this thing is going to be n times 4 over pi i out. So that is the peak of ir of t, which means we can now, uh, we have an equation for this, right? We can figure out what the time dependent current is with this amplitude. Cool. However, first of all, what I want to do is look at the average, right? We already had an equation stating what the average was, right? So the average v out is actually equal to the time average of V out of T over one half of the switching cycle, right? And we can do this integration, right? So we have two over TS from zero to TS over two times the peak N times V2 times sine omega T. So it's very similar to the previous example, right? And again, if we, if we do this, if we do this integration, what we end up getting is 
n times 2 over pi times d2. That is what the average output voltage is. And again, we can figure out using this, we know what the expression for v2 of t is, right? This is the amplitude of v2 of t, which means which means that we can write the time varying expression for v2 of t in the following way. n over 2, pi over 2n, right? v out times sine omega t, right? And again, no phases here. And again, similarly over here, ir of t, we know what the amplitude is, right? It's n 4 over pi i out. So we have n 4 over pi i out, and again, sinusoid with no phase difference, sine of omega t. And again, what does this mean? Looking into this input, it looks resistive. What is that resistance? What is that resistance, our equivalent? Well, it's equal to uh, the ratio of V2 to, I, to IR, right? That is the definition of resistance, right? The ratio of current to voltage, basically. We have expressions, so we have pi over 2n times V out sine omega t over n 4 over pi i out sine of omega t. Simplifying. This cancels with this. They're aligned, right? Because it's a, you could say, a uncontrolled rectifier. And what you end up getting is pi squared over 8 n squared, right? So again, what do we have? All right, also v out over i out. And we can simplify this even further, pi squared over 8 n squared, our load is equal to the equivalent resistance, right? So these two do, these two rectifiers do two different things, right? So now, because with this voltage-driven rectifier, we actually have a factor of pi squared over 8 as opposed to 8 over pi squared. And then we still have this factor of n squared, which is related to the turns ratio. That isn't going to change, right? Because we expect the turns ratio 1 to n to divide the load resistance by n squared. Right, so just looking at the difference between these two things. So, so for the current driven rectifier, we have the equivalent resistance is 8 over n squared pi squared times r load. And for the voltage driven rectifier, we have the equivalent resistance is pi squared over n squared, I'll say 8 r load, right? So just this flipping of pi squared over 8 is the difference between the voltage and current driven rectifier. So I believe this has already taken quite a bit of time. This is where I wanted to get. And actually, we, we can, we can you know, finish this off. The one final step is to make the model for the voltage driven rectifier. Right, so on the one side, the AC side actually sees an equivalent resistance, right? It sees this thing, pi squared over n squared 8, our load. This is V2. We have IR going in here. And then on the DC side, because this is a voltage-driven rectifier, we expect a voltage over here, DC voltage, right, with an amplitude of n2 over pi v2, which we know is actually v out, and then this, you know, feeds to our DC voltage right over here. Cool. So this is basically what the, the model is, and even though I haven't completed it, as an example, maybe what I can do, let's, let's just zoom out a bit. Yeah, so the, the, they look pretty similar. The difference is for the current driven rectifier on the DC side, we see a current. For the voltage driven, we see a voltage. What we've done is we've been able to insert, or now we can insert a, a block or an, a model into these blocks, right? We still haven't done this middle block yet. 
but for these two outer ones, the inverter and rectifier, we can we can stick st stuff in depending on what we have. So we have our load, right? So for the for the inverter, basically what we have is you know it looks like a current source followed by an AC voltage source. Then we have the resonant tank, the resonant filter, whatever you want to say. All right, and then in here, we're going to stick something that looks like an equivalent resistance, and then either a voltage or current source, depending on what type of rectifier you're using, over here. All right, and this is basically what the model is going to look like. So we're going to have some kind of voltage source over here, some kind of resonant tank, and the equivalent resistance. And with that, when we figure out what the model is for the resonant tank, we can solve the conversion ratio for a resonant converter. So that's it for this, because this video has gone on for quite a while, I believe. And uh, the next video, we're going to investigate this middle, this middle section. This is what we're going to look, look at in the next video. How do we model this? And funnily enough, we already know. Right, we know from other courses. Right, it's this. It's the same as any other kind of filter. We're going to use Bode plots, and uh, yeah, that's going to be what determines our game. Awesome. I'll talk to you guys later. Keep asking questions. I'll do my best to answer them, and I'll see you later.